Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, Constitutional History uh, for Liberty Classroom. I am uh, Brian McClanahan, and this is the first time you've seen me uh, in this particular uh, set of presentations in this course. Of course, you may have watched me in the lectures on uh, U.S. history in the first half of U.S. history, so I'd like to welcome you to this particular course and hope you enjoy it. Um, I think that uh, this uh, this uh, course on constitutional history, history will give you a firm understanding of the meaning of the Constitution from the colonial period into, until the present, really, and uh, uh, how we should interpret it, um, how, it how it came to be. Uh, American con constitutionalism in general and, and some of the theories behind American constitutionalism. So um, this particular presentation actually focuses on colonial constitutionalism. And I think uh, one of the most important things about this uh, particular time period is that the foundations for the United States Constitution uh, and the theories behind uh, the United States Constitution in so many ways are formed in this period of time, the colonial period. You could also look at, of course, the ancient constitutions, which Dr. Goodsman has done in the first presentation, going back to the Magna Charta, and maybe even before that. I mean, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the Romans and the Greeks when the Constitution was being drafted. Uh, when the Articles of Confederation were being drafted, when John Adams was thinking about the, the Constitution and uh, writing his uh, his book on American constitutionalism. So, I mean, the, the, the ancient constitutions, as Patrick Henry called them, are more than just, uh, you know, say, the British Constitution, and they also are uh, the colonial constitution. So, uh, this particular section will give you a, a little bit better understanding for those colonial documents, which are so important going forward. Uh, because one thing that's very important to note, it's one of the major themes of this entire uh, course, is that the local communities, whether it was the colonies themselves and then later the states, believed that they had a sovereign control of their internal affairs. And by internal affairs, they're talking about um, their judicial uh, affairs, which meant uh, you know, the, the legal structure, uh, whether it meant their currency, uh, whether it meant... Um, uh, their uh, particular in intra-state trade later on, uh, so their domestic concerns. I mean, all these things uh, were considered local matters. And so there was always a general government uh, in the colonial period. That would be the uh, British system, uh, the, the, the uh, parliament. And in the later period, of course, that would be the United States Constitution and the Articles of Confederation. So there's always this give and take. In the colonial period, it was the colonies against uh, Parliament, and the later period, it would be the states against the Articles, and then later the states against the Constitution. Uh, nothing had changed from the colonial period forward in that regard until you get to the 20th century, or the late 19th and early 20th century, when the states have pretty much been destroyed by the uh, central authority. So let's start uh, with... Um, uh, the first slide. Now, there's a distinct contrast between the colonial legislatures, the parliaments there, and the British Empire. Parliamentary authority in the British Empire was there for general purposes. Uh, parliamentary authority in the colonies, again, was there for domestic concerns. Uh, and what the colonies said is that the, uh, the sphere of influence for the general empire was basically trade and defense. Everything else was left to the colonies themselves. So when you get to the Constitution and you start looking at the powers that were granted in Article 1, Section 8, or the Articles of Confederation and the limited powers that were granted to the central authority there, essentially they're building it off the model that they had during the colonial period. For years, taxing policy, currency policies, you know, the, the legal structure of the colonies was essentially set up independently of the British Empire. And when the British Empire tried to clamp down on that, and came down hard, put the colonies under their thumb, so to speak, that's when the colonies started getting a little bit uh, upset about uh, colon uh, British colonial policy. And it wasn't just in North America. Other colonies, say, for example, the Bahamas and also Ireland, had the same problems. Uh, so this, this uh, when the British decide that they're going to micromanage the colonies from London, that's when the real rub began. Uh, because that was seen outside, the, the colonists weren't represented in that parliament in London, so that was seen as to being outside of their purview, their legislative authority. And this really is the English tradition. You can even find it in the local counties and uh, kind of a decentralized model throughout much of English history. Uh, basically from the 1200s to the 1600s, uh, you have this decentralized model. And when the uh, parliament started to gain more control over those uh, counties and in towns, uh, there was always a, a reaction to that, 
uh, from the local authority. I mean, uh, just like um, you would have, of course, in the United States, when the central or general government tried to crack down on the co- on, on the states themselves, uh, that was always seen as an affront to American constitutional tradition, which, of course, was based on English constitutional tradition. So, and really what you have here is the foundation of American constitutionalism. The other thing I have to note is that there are, there are written and unwritten constitutions. A written constitution is, of course, what we have in the United States and also in the 50 states at large. And the idea of a written constitution is to limit the power of the central authority. If you have a written constitution, that is different than an unwritten constitution, which can change over time. Uh, the British actually have an unwritten constitution, and that unwritten constitution is subject to the common law or judicial interpretation. Uh, so essentially what we have in the United States today is a written constitution and an unwritten constitution. The written constitution is a thing that uh, everyone who says, okay, well, let's follow the constitution as ratified. That's what we're talking about. The unwritten constitution is what's happened afterwards through Supreme Court decisions, uh, you know, federal court decisions, and on down the line. So when you go to law school, and uh, Dr. Guzman could attest to this, and you take a constitutional law course, what you are learning is the common law. You're learning what the Supreme Court has said about the Constitution, not the Constitution itself, and not the ratification debates, which are more important than anything else, because that's the Constitution that was ratified. That's what they said it meant. Uh, and when you have these ratifiers saying, this is what the Constitution means, we wrote it, this is what it meant, uh, whether, or the ratifiers who were not part of the Philadelphia Convention saying, well, I think it's going to mean this, uh, that's the Constitution uh, as ratified. So... Um, it's not what John Marshall said or some Supreme Court justice later on said. Uh, it is what the ratifier said that counts. So that's a written constitution. An unwritten constitution is this common law system that we've now, that we now have. So, uh, when, when we're talking about written versus unwritten constitutions, you know, we're looking at two different playing fields. Uh, in one case, uh, you know, one group is playing baseball, the other group is playing football. And what we need to do is get back on this, playing the same game because if we're playing the same game for a written constitution, then uh, generally the proponents of a loose construction have no leg to stand on, uh, whereas the proponents of a written, of, you know, strict construction, often called strict construction, uh, are controlling the field. So uh, this is one of the major obstacles that we have in, in American constitutional interpretation. So let's start with Virginia, and what I'm going to do is look at the various colonial charters, uh, some of the important ones. And so uh, we'll start with Virginia here. Uh, the colonial charter in Virginia was uh, established between 1606 and 1611, uh, and the first elections in Virginia were held in 1607. Uh, the first meeting of the House of Burgesses was not till 1619 in Jamestown, but Virginia is the oldest legislative assembly, the Virginia House of Burgesses is the oldest legislative assembly in the United States. And what you're seeing here is the English model adapted to American circumstances. Uh, the uh, Virginia Constitution was codified in the 1621 Ordinances for Virginia, and I've linked it here. You can actually go out, click on that, uh, and find it on the web and read through it. It's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, one of the important things to note, though, is that the, the Virginia uh, Ordinances were uh, emphatic that uh, all local concerns were to be uh, taken care of by the Virginia House of Burgesses, not Parliament. Uh, now, uh, and, and I'm actually going to quote this in a second. So Virginia is actually saying, well, local concerns are our, are our matters. Uh, you know, anything else for the empire, of course, is your, is your domain. But they're establishing a framework of government, uh, a, a written constitution. So when Patrick Henry in 1775 said, you know, he's, he's relying on his ancient constitutions, uh, this is what he's talking about. Uh, you know, the ancient constitutions of his fathers go back to this 1600 uh, 1621 Ordinance of Virginia and the Colonial Charter. Uh, and then, of course, he's also talking about the Magna Charter and some of the other things that had happened, of course, in Britain beforehand. But these co- colonial constitutions are very important because as we move through uh, the colonial history, this is what people are going to be referring to when they say, well, our rights are being violated, our rights that are contained in these uh, particular colonial charters. So let's go to the next slide and I actually have a quotation here from the uh, Virginia Ordinances. And it said, provided that no law or ordinance made in the said General Assembly, of course, that's the Assembly of Virginia, shall, shall be or continue to force, continue in force of validity, unless the same shall be solemnly ratified and confirmed in a general court, quarter, court of the said company here in England, and so ratified be returned to them under our seal. So they're basically saying they have to have approval for these laws. But it being our intent to afford the like measure also unto the said colony, that after the government of the said colony shall once have been well framed, 
and settled accordingly, which is to be done by us, as by authority to derive from his majesty, and the same shall have been so by us declared, no orders of court afterwards shall bind the said colony unless they be ratified in like manner in the general assemblies. So now they're saying, okay, well, we have to, we have these laws that come out of the general assemblies, and they're saying they have to have permission from uh, England to do these things, but in reality, that didn't happen very much. Uh, so they can make laws in the general assemblies for Virginia. And uh, before that point, you know, they had to have the, uh, the authority of the, um, the uh, colony itself, the general court or court. Uh, but uh, after that, uh, the General Assembly can do essentially what they want. Um, and uh, they're not, I mean, Britain is not saying you're free from us. But, you know, Patrick Henry was actually saying in 1765, Virginia was independent of Great Britain. And this is why, because he's saying we've been doing this stuff for a hundred years already. We've had our own currency laws, we've had our own taxes, we've had our own trade laws, we've had our own court system, we've had our own legislature. Why do we need you? Uh, all you're doing is now trying to tax us. And uh, that's not authorized. Um, so th this is what Henry's talking about here. All right, on to Massachusetts. Uh, the General Court of Massachusetts was established essentially in 1629 through the Charter of Massachusetts Bay. And uh, the Cambridge Agreement of 1629 uh, actually established a local versus imperial control. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, of course, you know, the local government, the, the uh, general court, is going to have a tremendous amount of control over the colony of Massachusetts itself with very little input from the empire. And uh, they, this is what they bristled against in, uh, in the uh, 18th century when you start getting this period uh, where the British, again, are starting to put their thumb on the uh, colonial government. So... This was seen as a real problem. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting about Massachusetts, you know, uh, 12 years after they have their general, their charter, the uh, Massachusetts, uh, uh, people of Massachusetts will come up with something called the Massachusetts Body of Liberties. So here essentially is, is, is before we even have the English Bill of Rights, like a, a Bill of Rights. Uh, it, it does outline laws and capital laws, but it also uh, talks about the rights that women have and the rights that children have, for example. Uh, it talks about one interesting component of it is that there are no monopolies allowed in Massachusetts. And when you get to the Tea Act of uh, 1773, essentially that's what they were bristling against. This is a monopoly, and that's not allowed by their body of liberties. You can't have a monopoly in the colony of Massachusetts. So, hence the Tea Party. Uh, and uh, this this is interesting stuff. If you click on it and read it and see what uh, what it was, it's several you know hundred. Uh, provisions here and see what the um, people of Massachusetts were saying at the time uh, and what kind of liberties they had. Uh, you know, it, it really establishes the fact that uh, Massachusetts was very much uh, independent from Great Britain from 1641 forward. Uh, that they, uh, by the 1760s, they had over a hundred years of essentially independence uh, from the uh, from the British government. Now, of course. They did rely on the British government in the 1760s and 50s to uh, help fight uh, the French and Indian War, but that was the exception rather than the rule. Uh, you know, generally Massachusetts did everything on its own. And then we have Maryland, uh, 1632. The Charter of Maryland established the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, the Charter gave Lord Baltimore control over the colony because, of course, Maryland was a proprietary colony. But the Charter also allowed for a colonial legislature to ensure effective government. This is what they said, to ensure effective government. So they understood well that Lord Baltimore could not govern the colony from London, from England. Uh, it couldn't happen. There's no way. Uh, so the colony has to have a lot of autonomy. They have to be able to set their own tax laws, currency laws, a judicial system. Uh, and that's going to be separate from what Lord Baltimore wants at times. Uh, because the people there in Maryland uh, have a better understanding for what's going on in Maryland. Um, and in, in the 17th century, of course, it took weeks to go from Maryland to uh, England, so uh, communication was very difficult. And so you had to have this situation. Now, people, I mean, that's the common argument. Well, today we have such rapid communication, this doesn't have to happen. But typically, uh, even when you talk about the United States government, the representatives that go to Washington aren't in their state anymore or the local communities very often. And so their feet aren't really on the ground there. They don't really know what's going on all the time. And so it's very difficult to make decisions for the people of, uh, you know, pick your state and pick your community when you're living insulated in Washington, D.C. It's the same situation. Where if you're a thousand miles away at times or more from that central government, and what kind of authority should that central, should that central government have even in the day of modern rapid communication? So you have local versus imperial control again here, and the parliamentary model. You know, they have a general assembly. 
Uh, the, Virginia has a House of Burgesses. Uh, Mar- Massachusetts has a general court. These are parliamentary assemblies. Uh, of course, the governors typically, by, by, by the uh, 1700s, are appointed by the king. But uh, the governors didn't always have as much control as they wanted. They really had to have a give and take with the uh, general assemblies or the, the, uh, the House of Burgesses or the general court, whatever the local uh, government was, in order to get anything done. Uh, so that was always recognized. Connecticut organized the government in 1639. Uh, they also established a local legislature, which they called the General Assembly as well, and a governor. Uh, elections were actually outlined in this uh, organizational document, including term length and civil liberties. So very much like uh, the Massachusetts document in 1641, uh, Connecticut does the same thing. Um, and that, that's actually... Uh, typical of New England, because New England was receptive to what uh, Thomas Jefferson called the war republics and local power. Each uh, city in in New England would typically have its own constitution. And so you'd have these very small republics uh, where uh, people had a lot of control over the government, particularly if you remember, you had to be a member of of the church there, the Congregationalist Church in these areas, uh, in order to vote. But they had a lot of control over the government. There was no real central authority uh, they had this uh, overarching, uh, you know, civil liberties essentially, but in this overarching government. But the, the local communities had a lot of control and a lot of say in what happened in their in their towns. Uh, so, <clears throat> as we move forward again, this is the local control that the colonists wanted. And if you look at, say, Roger Sherman of Connecticut uh, in the founding period, you know, one of the great founding fathers, he's a great states writer, uh, states rights guy, great states rights guy uh, from Connecticut. Uh, and he's saying essentially, you know, Connecticut does we don't need a Bill of Rights because we have a Bill of Rights in Connecticut. So what do we need a Bill of Rights for in the central government? He was already talking about, you know, the state's rights tradition in the North. And if you look at secession, which we talk about much later in the course, uh, secession was openly discussed in the North first, and for good reason. Northerners were very interested in states' rights. It was only later that they said you know, the national government suits them better because at that point they were controlling it. Uh, so they had started acting like the British. <laughs> and um, it's unfortunate that that happened because, again, New England has a great states' rights tradition. Even to this day, you know, there's the Second Vermont Republic, uh, which is Thomas Naylor's organization trying to uh, have Vermont secede from the Union uh, because they don't think the central government is leftist enough. And um, so and all, more power to them. I mean, if, if Vermont wants to leave the Union, they should be able to. And that's self-determination. If they have their local constitutions and local government, it would be more effective for the people of Vermont than the United States Constitution, then that's what uh, they should be uh, doing there in Vermont. And so, you know, I've, I've listed again the organizational documents uh, there, uh, number one and number two, so you can look at these things and see uh, what exactly the kinetic cutters were talking about. Uh, New Hampshire and Rhode Island. Uh, New Hampshire organized the government in 1641, uh, and they did this after coming under the jurisdiction of Massachusetts. Again, this local versus imperial power. Uh, they actually have a very interesting statement in their uh, particular uh, constitution. It said local laws were supreme when they are not repugnant to the laws of England. That is a great quote, and that's directly from this charter. As long as they're not repugnant to the laws of England, their laws are supreme. So here you already have, in 1641, the establishment of this, basically, a, a what we would call the Tenth Amendment. Uh, today, you know, so there are certain areas that they are supreme. The laws of England are supreme in other areas, and as long as they can make all the laws they want, as long as they don't go against the uh, the laws of England. Well, there you have it. Uh, as we move forward, and you start looking at things like you know, which all laws are delegated, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those laws are supreme, a supremacy clause in the Constitution. There's the give and take all the way back in the 1600s. And I would, I would encourage you, again, to read these particular documents and look through them uh, because it will give you a nice foundation as we go forward in the course and start talking about uh, you know, the Articles of Confederation, ultimately, and uh, then the later the Constitution. Uh, Rhode Island organized the government also in 1641. And out like Connecticut, it outlined the structure of government. It was officially given a charter in 1663. But again, local authority was recognized in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, the <clears throat> the New England states were so uh, influenced by local authority throughout the colonial period. It's almost shocking that when we get to the 19th century, they are the they are the driving factor behind centralization, uh, because for so many years, for hundreds of years, 
It was uh, New England, or you know, at least over 100 years, 150 years. It was New England who was leading the charge in states' rights. And then all of a sudden in the 19th century, that flips. And uh, that destroyed this great old uh, local tradition in New England. That's still there. Again, as I mentioned with Thomas Naylor, it's still there. But New England seems to think uh, when you get to the reforming period that everyone has to live like them. And uh, even John Winthrop, or John Winthrop as we call it, you know, the Englanders called him John Winthrop. Even John, uh, John Winthrop said, look, um, the, uh, we have the shining city on a hill, but what did that mean? I mean, he wanted everyone in the area to be like New England. And of course, that very aggressive nationalism, that very aggressive uh, ideology is going to affect the United States later on, unfortunately. Uh, because the New England people did, the Congregationalists there did believe, these Puritans did believe that everyone should ultimately live like them, that they should set the standard for the rest of England and the world. Uh, and that will cause, uh, that will be problematic uh, later on. Uh, North Carolina and New Jersey each have similar constitutions. They're both proprietary colonies. Uh, and let me make a distinction here because I've mentioned this a couple of times. A proprietary colony is a colony that's under control of an individual or board uh, you know, a group of individuals. A royal colony would be one directly under the control of the crown. Almost every colony was established as a proprietary colony. Uh, and uh, that was that suited these colonies just fine because the crown actually would reap the benefits from it while the people of these particular areas were going over here on their own blood and hook to make these things work. So ultimately, though, the crown would take the colonies over. So you have the English crown benefiting from this proprietary impulse early on, the, you know, the free... Uh, free market, individualism, independence, all these things, they're benefiting from that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, these people um, are, are also benefiting from it who started out, I mean, because there's a tremendous amount of liberty in this uh, particular situation. Uh, New Jersey, of course, was born from the Anglo-Dutch War of 1664, and they had a, a charter similar to that of North Carolina, which was written by John Locke in 1669. Uh, East and West Jersey each had their own constitutions, 1683 and 1676, uh, respectively, and North Carolina uh, was a proprietary colony with Anthony Ashley Cooper, the Earl of Shaftesbury, as the dominant force, and their particular government was called the 1669 Fundamental Constitutions. Uh, so here you again have local self-government in each one of these cases. In the North Carolina Constitution, these two constitutions are really interesting because, for example, the right to bear arms is well established uh, in these particular constitutions, and with the Lockean influence uh, who would later write the English Bill of Rights, uh, you're starting to see some of that. So, uh, you know, they did establish a hereditary aristocracy, for example, in North Carolina, but you're starting to see this uh, very Lockean model, uh, you know, now written down and codified, uh, though this stuff was also there in Massachusetts without John Locke having any influence whatsoever. Um, so, you know, that local control, again, I have to hammer that home, local control, local control, local control, because... If we understand that local control background, then when we get to the states, and you're in the Articles of Confederation, and when we get to the United States Constitution, this all starts to make sense. It's only recently, the last 150 years, that people have thought that America was all about centralization. Or as, you know, Barack Obama recently said, there's, uh, you know, uh, we, we, one colony seceded from the British Empire. He didn't use seceded, but one colony declared its independence. One colony, I thought there were 13. <laughs> and 13 states were given their independence in 1783 by the British Empire. All right, Pennsylvania uh, was established by William, Quinn, William Penn, excuse me, and had a tremendous Quaker influence. Here again, you have local self-government and civil, civil liberties recognized. Um, the, uh, the Charter of Privileges was their particular constitution. And if any group of people in, in, um, in the Americas, uh, North America, British North American colonies were interested in civil liberties, it was the Quakers. And I talk a lot about this in the presentation uh, in the first half of the American history course, uh, United States history up to 1877, and how the Quakers were radical libertarians in so many ways. I mean, they believed in reciprocal liberty. And so uh, their frame of government and charter of privileges, which is their Bill of Rights, outline that. I mean, they're, they're, they're explicit in what kind of privileges and rights the people of Pennsylvania will have. And they firmly believe in local control. Uh, so even though the Quakers are... Um, uh, always seen as more pacifistic, uh, they definitely believe that the uh, the colony should have control over local matters, and that when the British come in and try to put their thumb down, and this is John Dickinson later on, you know, saying, well, I mean, you can regulate our trade, but you cannot tax us. Uh, you cannot regulate our internal affairs, only our trade. Uh, and when he said that in the letters from a farmer from Pennsylvania, I mean, that's what he was saying. This was based on the ancient constitutions of Pennsylvania. Okay, so, uh, in summary... 
the ancient constitutions and the rights of Englishmen, uh, are, of course, are often used to uh, justify breaking away from the British Empire in um, 1776. And this wasn't fabricated out of thin air. You know, some people would say that this is just something new in the 1770s. That, uh, this is more reactionary. They're simply upset over taxes and taxes alone. Well, as I talk about in the next presentation, that's not the case. Um, these things came out of concrete written constitutions of the colonies. When they said the British were violating their, their constitutions, that's what they meant. They were violating the relationship the British government in London, the Parliament, had had from the 1600s forward. And so when we get to the, uh, you know, the war, uh, in 17, and, and the time leading up to the war, 1765 to 1775, it's evident, and again, I'll go over this in the next presentation, it's evident that what the British are doing was violating this century-old tradition and the relationship that they had with the colonies uh, that was very important uh, and, and cherished by the colonial governments and, of course, the people of, of British North America. Many of the people who are going to be opposing the, Brit the, the British uh, parliamentary control over the colonies in the 1760s were third and fourth generation Americans, well-versed uh, in the ancient traditions of the colonies themselves and, of course, of the rights of Englishmen, the laws of England. So this wasn't just fabricated out of thin air. It's not just some stupid reactionary impulse that uh, drive these people into a war with Britain. They had had enough after 10 years of suffering, and uh, their constitutions dictated that they had certain rights and privileges that were being violated. Not only uh, they were not represented, but the, the, the British were doing other things that were uh, the antithesis of their constitutions. So, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, moving forward, uh, you're going to see a lot more of this uh, particular idea that local government is supreme, uh, and, and its uh, sphere of influence, um, that they only delegate certain authority to the, to the central authority, uh, and that uh, all uh, you know, domestic concerns should be handled by the local authority, not the central government. So again, this, this idea of there's a general welfare, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the next presentation, but it's trade and defense. That's the only thing the central authority should really be doing for the colonies themselves. All right, well, I'll see you next time.